everybody. My name is Sarah bachman Ducey, and I am college-wide chair for integrative studies and director for the Paul Peck Humanities Institute at Montgomery College. I would really like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today to celebrate the completion of a um, pilot program called the Montgomery College Fellows at the Library of Congress. Pilot program. We have a wonderful afternoon ahead of us as we hear from various parties involved in the development of the innovative pilot, as well as those who've had a chance to participate, including our six fellows, two librarians, and four faculty members from Montgomery College, which is in suburban Maryland, just miles outside of Washington, DC. Our first speaker today is Jane McAuliffe. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. McAuliffe. She is the inaugural director of national and international outreach here at the Library of Congress. Her previous positions include distinguished visiting scholar. Uh, and when she was in that role, in fact, she met one of our student interns, Erica Watts. She was then the director of the John W. w. Kluge Center here at the library. Previously, she was president of Bryn Mawr College. And she was a dean of arts and science at Georgetown University. During her years at Bryn Mawr, she championed global women's initiatives, partnerships with other universities and colleges, convening international conferences on campus, helping create what is known as the Women in Public Service Project. She expanded their international enrollment threefold and formulated the plan for Bryn Mawr, which is a strategic vision for the college. She is a scholar. She is a world-renowned scholar of the Quran. Islam and Muslim Christian relations. She is the general editor of the six volume encyclopedia of the Quran, Brill Publishers, and the first major reference work for the Quran in Western languages. She has published numerous other books on the Quran. She received her BA from Trinity College in Washington, DC, and her MA and PhD from the University of Toronto. I'd like to welcome Dr. Jane McAuliffe to the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great to be here. Great to be hosting you in this gorgeous setting, which I always love to enjoy. On May 21st, 2015, the Library of Congress announced a new fellowship program in collaboration with Montgomery College, the Montgomery College Fellows Program. The purpose of the program was to explore ways in which Montgomery College faculty and librarians could take advantage of the rich collections and resources of the Library of Congress to enhance their teaching and their library service. So to that end, Montgomery College appointed three faculty members and two librarians as the inaugural fellows. And here are some of the things that they did this year. Last summer, the fellows worked with our educational outreach program for a week-long teacher institute on teaching with primary sources. And Leanne Potter, your director last summer is here with us, with us today. During the fall and the spring semesters, the intern and fellowship program staff arranged for a series of orientations and behind the scenes tours of the library's reading rooms, such as the African and Middle Eastern reading room, the Asian reading room, prints and photographs, and the list is much longer than I will repeat this afternoon. A Montgomery College fellows also worked with Library of Congress specialists to strengthen course syllabi and to develop resources that can create a richer learning environment at the college itself. So today's event is going to showcase that, showcase the findings and the insights of the Montgomery College fellows who participated in this pilot program at the Library of Congress. But before we launch ourselves into that, let's say a word of thanks to those who generated this whole event and this whole idea. The idea came from Tanner Ray, who's right over there, the director of Montgomery College Libraries and Information Services, and from Sarah bachman who from whom you've just heard, college-wide chair for integrative studies and director of the Paul Peck Humanities Center. From the Library of Congress side, we can point to the successful efforts of two of our colleagues, 
Blaine Desi. Blaine, you're here. There you are, Blaine. Thank you. Blaine Desi, who is Director of National Enterprises within National and International Outreach, and he brokered the cooperative agreement with Montgomery College, the one that was signed just about a year ago. And jo George Colburn, who's chief of our interns and fellowship programs, who unfortunately could not be with us today, but who has successfully guided the program during this pilot year. I think both the Library of Congress and Montgomery College acknowledge that this has been a very positive and productive pilot year, and we have agreed to explore the possible extension of the program through the next academic year. So with that brief introduction, I'm very pleased now to turn the program over to Mrs. Ms. Carolyn Terry, Associate Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Montgomery College. Welcome to the podium, and thank you. Um, I just want to take a tiny moment here to thank um, Dr. McAuliffe for her support and to give her a copy of our um, book called The Potomac Review. This is the most recent uh, issue of a literary journal that is managed at the college, and there's also a small um, gift for you. Oh, well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ms. Carolyn Terry. She is the Associate Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Montgomery College. Prior to her appointment in this position, she has held a numerous roles at the college, and I would just like to say that she has done a remarkable job of growing through the leadership process to become a really special person for us. And I'm just gonna sort of skate over um, a really long and lovely career, starting with um, a full-time faculty member in English at our Rockville uh, program, then becoming uh, head of our uh, Reading Writing Center, chair of the English program, dean for humanities first at the Rockville campus and then college-wide, and on and on, and now she is, as I said, associate senior vice president for academic affairs. She has um, led initiatives in um, English, philosophy, and world languages. She was important in, from the very beginning in the starting of our, our honors program, especially a signature program we call the Montgomery Scholars. She has provided guidance to our women's studies program from its inception. And she has recently had the joy and pleasure of implementing our college's academic restructuring plan. I'm guessing the people at the library have a sense for how fun that has been. Um, she, she has worked with the Paul Peck Humanities Institute also since its uh, beginning and is an incredible supporter of us. And I like to say that Carolyn is um, oh, probably best described with the word yes. Now, she may challenge me on this, she may say no, but I just have to tell you, when I go to her and I say, Carolyn, we have this idea, she says, yes. How can I help you? How can I make it so? And that's just a, a wonderful kind of a place to be when you work with someone with that level of support. Carolyn, Terry, please come up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm just very happy to be here. I see so many familiar faces in the audience, and one of the um, regrets about moving out of the campus to the central office, you know, the, the Death Star, as it's known, is that I don't get to see the faculty as often as I used to, so it's really nice to see everybody here today. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Pollard, President of Montgomery College, and Dr. Rye, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, I want to give my greetings to all of you as well as to our partners at the Library of Congress. So I was asked today to talk about Montgomery College and to give those of the people in the audience who maybe are not as familiar with our institution an idea of who we are and what we do, and more importantly, who our students are. So, you know, Montgomery College is very typical of most community colleges. Our students are a little bit older than the typical traditional college student. Our students are quite diverse, and if you look at the back of this lovely program that Sarah has provided to you, there's a demographic chart of our students, and you can see that the uh, average age of our students is around in the high 20s. Um, we have 73% of our students return to us year to year, so we tend to be a fairly stable group. We have an incredibly diverse body of students. Our students are really no demographic majority. 
We are a blending of 170 countries plus a good representation of the Washington DC area. And in many ways, the history of Montgomery College reflects the history of community colleges in general. Montgomery College started in 1946, right after the GI Bill established funding for students to go to college and which really changed the landscape of higher education. So our students came to first the Bethesda Chevy Chase High School site and our college developed as the population followed 270 and Route 355 north. Uh, in the 1970s, another explosion of population in the college-going population took us to the Rockville campus, and then in the late 1980s to the Germantown campus. So we are now across the three different sites and many, many workforce development sites throughout the county. So while we can talk a little bit about the demographics of our students and you can see who they are, there really is no such thing that I would say is a typical community college student. We have students across the spectrum. And having been at Montgomery College a long time, and it really has been almost 28 years now, um, I can say from my experience that I have seen the reflection of the world at Montgomery College. When I came to Montgomery College as a faculty member, many of our students were refugees from Asian countries. And they were following their parents into Montgomery County. And then in the 1990s, we saw a lot of students from the Middle East. And then in the 2000s, we saw a lot of students from Latin American countries. And recently, we see many students from African countries. But along the way, those students have stayed in the county and their children have come to Montgomery College. So it's a very rich culture at Montgomery College and among our students. But then a lot of the students are students like I was, the first in my family to go to college, not knowing anything about what higher education has to offer, having no models to show the way. And I can say from when I was, uh, I went to a state university, but when I was uh, young, I loved to go to the library. That was the thing I was allowed to do. I couldn't see a PG movie, but I could go to the library. And I was allowed to walk to the library and I could go get books. And in fact, um, I remember one time the nuns in my little Catholic school in New York City yelled at me because they had driven past me in their station wagon, because really there are station wagons full of nuns in New York City. <laughs> and they had passed me and I was reading a book walking along the street and not lifting my head and they thought I was going to be killed. So I used to do this as a child. And so libraries were the place that I went to. My parents read at home. It's not like they weren't into books, but I was into books. And I became an English major. And when I went to college, the library was where I went. And when my younger brothers and sisters came to see me, I wouldn't take them to the frat parties. I would take them to the library. I'd say, come look at the library. They thought that was weird, but I enjoyed it. So when I came to Washington, D.C., as a, a young, right out of graduate school, uh, new person, new college uh, educator, I came to the Library of Congress, thinking, here I am, I'm at the library. But to be honest, I didn't know what to do with it. I came in the, the reading room, because you always go to the reading room, and as somebody reminded me, when they said, where are you going today? I said, oh, I'm going to the Library of Congress. Oh yeah, that's National Treasure Book of Secrets, right? The reading room? Yes, that's kind of where I'm going. And so I went to the reading room and I recalled a book, which was very exciting, but I didn't know what I was doing. And to be honest, I hadn't come back to the Library of Congress for many years, but here it was, right on the metro, but I never went. When did I learn about what the Library of Congress has to offer me? Through Montgomery College's students. When we started our internship program and our students came to the Library of Congress and they worked with the curators and they worked with the scholars and they did their own research and came back to tell us about it, that's when I learned about the Library of Congress and what the Cong library has to offer all of us. So this is why I'm so excited about this partnership, because I've seen the transformative nature of work between students and faculty. And I know that in this fellowship, which we'll hear about today, you'll see how the students' lives are transformed. And guess what? They bring their brothers and sisters to the library, and they bring their parents, and they tell their friends, and you start to see a whole new set of people 
coming into the Library of Congress. That's where I think the excitement's going to be. So I'm very happy to, to have endorsed the pilot, to have helped it along. Any small part I may have played in getting this started, I'm very appreciative to Sarah and to Tanner for coming to me a couple of uh, semesters ago and saying we have this idea. And I think we're gonna be really, really pleased by what we see come out of this partnership. So thank you again. I'm gonna turn the podium over to Sarah once again, and I look forward to hearing from the faculty. Our next speaker is Tanner Ray. Mr. Tanner Ray is Director of College Libraries and Information Services at Montgomery College. He's committed to developing high-quality, user-centric services that support student success. In support of that, he's committed to ongoing professional development. And this program is about as beautiful a development program as, as I might have seen. Tanner joined Montgomery College in 2012. He oversees programs and services at four libraries across our three campuses. He's been employed as a librarian for 28 years, including at several universities, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Agricultural Library, and National Library of Medicine. He received his uh, bachelor's degree from the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and his MLS from the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. I really do want to take a moment to recognize Tanner's inspiration and contribution to this pilot. This program simply doesn't exist at all without his idea. This is his baby. Um, so I would like to say thank you, Tanner, and I'd like to take an extra moment of applause for you. Welcome, Tanner. Good afternoon. I, I really cannot take full credit for this, and Sarah has been a phenomenal partner also in conceptualizing this at the college, as well as Blaine, Desi, and Don Stitzel, who we worked with in the early stages, and the other partners we've had. So, so as much as you might give me full credit for this, I really feel, Sarah, that you have been a fantastic partner also. I'm very pleased to be with all of you today at the end of the Montgomery College Fellows at the Library of Congress pilot program at the end of our first year. The pilot that we are showcasing today is the result of discussions that began in, way back in early 2013 to expand the existing partnership that included our student interns here at the Library of Congress. It is gratifying to see the outcome of the partnership expansion, and I'm so proud of everyone's strong contributions. For me, a hallmark of this pilot is the fact that we have a cohort, not just of faculty, but of faculty and librarians working together as fellows, as peers. As Vicki Drake said in the pilot report, she was afforded an opportunity that librarians do not get to have too often, the chance to interact and coordinate with faculty members in a deeper capacity than in a fleeting instruction session. Working with the other members of the fellowship toward a goal was a unique experience, and learning about the other side's pressures and needs was an eye-opening experience. I think that's one of the aspects of this program that is so key. The faculty and librarians work together during the year to develop the best ways to use the rich resources at the Library of Congress to increase our students' success. Through the fellowship, both faculty and librarian fellows are working on developing materials and, and approaches that support both faculty and student success at Montgomery College, and all have had an opportunity to develop a research agenda and very importantly, participate in 12 to 18 months of professional development. Um, that, that was done with their Library of Congress partners. The pilot also has a very strong focus on ultimately assisting the college with efforts to improve student success through high impact educational practices, such as conducting original research with Library of Congress materials. The pilot has had a strong focus on bringing Montgomery College students and faculty to the library both virtually and in person. And the, and the partnership is mutually advantageous in its impacts with employees and college students and the mission of the institutions. As you will hear about the fellows' presentations, the librarian fellow experience has had a slightly different focus than the faculty one, um, resulting you know, in some differences in what we've done. The products that have been developed have tended to have a more generalizable use they are not targeted to a specific course like the faculty experience. 
You will hear about primary resources workshops developed and delivered to faculty and other college employees and a tutorial and LibGuide related to primary resources based on the LC experience that can be used by all Montgomery College students, faculty, and staff, and beyond, including the Montgomery County Public Schools. Since librarians do not have a semester-long class with students, it is hard for a librarian to take a class to the library. So as you'll see, the librarian developed materials have a strong emphasis on using the rich Library of Congress digital collections. As Director of College Libraries and Information Services at Montgomery College, I want to sincerely thank our Library of Congress partners for all that they have done to create this pilot program and engaging so effectively with our fellows and their students. Lastly, I want to congratulate our fellows for their engagement with the fellowship and the impact they're having and will continue to have on student success at Montgomery College. I very much look forward to our continuing partnership beyond our, the inaugural fellows group with benefits to both our institutions and beyond. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Barry Howard. Barry is Program Specialist for the Library of Congress Internship and Fellowship Programs Division, and he's been an integral part of many innovative initiatives since he came to the library in 2009. Previously, he was a Program Manager at the Digital Library Federation during a pivotal time in that organization's history. During his time here, he has led, facilitated, and coordinated community building activities to engage internal and external partners, provided project management expertise to develop uh, the electronic copyright office system, digital preservation outreach and education program, national digital information and infrastructure preservation program, National Digital Stewardship Alliance and the National Digital Stewardship Residency Program. So you can see he's had his hand uh, in a lot of very important programs here and that has really actually led to some very talented work for us, I think. He is a certified project manage manager in good standing with the Project Management Institute and we saw those skills in, in action. He was honored in 2014 with the Raymond Von Dran Memorial Award from the Catholic University of America their Department of Library Science in recognition of outstanding innovation, collaboration, and leadership in the library and information science profession. One of my favorite things about um, Barry is that he is an Eagle Scout and a lifetime member of the National Eagle Scout Association. And I have two daughters with gold awards uh, from the Girl Scouts, so I'm always looking for our people out there. Um, he received his BFA from East Carolina University and an MSLS from the Catholic University of America. What you should know is that Barry has been our face-to-face uh, -face, um, experience of the library. He was the man who helped us with um, organizing the tremendously large number of orientations. And I, I understand that the library is actually working to have more orientations for each of the divisions and programs. And I just have to let you know that we know that you all are doing your jobs because we had benefit of a tremendous number of these experiences with more than 30 different library employees that worked with our fellows, which to me is a stunning and impressive number. And Barry was at the helm um, organizing and orchestrating that kind of work. Barry? Yeah, I was going to stand up here and tell you about how I was exposed to libraries, collections, and staff through this program, but I don't think that would be quite as interesting or as uh, um, uh, relevant to today's activities and, and what you'll hear about um, through the various testimonies of the cohort as we go through the afternoon. So in the spirit of Jane's characterization of the pilot as a positive and productive um, endeavor, um, I want to take a few minutes to share my perspective on what is important about the pilot project. So first, um, I think that the project was very well conceived in how it recognized a natural alignment of the missions of both the Library of Congress and Montgomery College to engage, empower, inform, and inspire a new generation of higher education students through supporting the intellectual and creative endeavors of the Montgomery College Fellows. Second, the project bears witness to the value of the library's collections and staff 
And over the course of our afternoon program, you'll hear testimony about how it has impacted and enriched the lives of these educators and the ultimate benefactors, their students. Third, the project leveraged divisional um, alignment of several Library of Congress units. So there were a dozen reading rooms in our custodial division, library services, and then the, the newly formed, it was mentioned earlier as Jane was, um, was introduced, the National and International Outreach Service Unit um, has two divisions that were implicated in the pilot project, and that is educational outreach and um, the program that I work for, uh, in internship and fellowship programs. And through this joint effort, we, uh, in the words of Educational Outreach's um, Summer Institute, Summer Teacher Institute, uh, sort of unlocked the power of primary resources in service of education. So uh, what excites me about this pilot project is to see how the fellows have harnessed this power of primary resources to manifest the passing of the proverbial Jeffersonian torch of knowledge that sits atop of this building on the dome. And uh, the, the concept, for, the, for those of you that aren't familiar with the quote, is that, um, that knowledge is like a, a light from a candle and that it doesn't diminish yours to pass it on to others. And I think that the fellows have been, are a wonderful conduit for, for that passing of knowledge as they have interacted with the library staff and now they share the knowledge that they have um, gained from this endeavor to their students and pass it along to benefit the next generation of learners, but not only learners, but the next generation of experts, professionals, scholars, and teachers to increase their efficacy in decision-making, scholarly communication, and enriching their lives in a variety of ways. So thank you for your time, and Sarah again. That was lovely. We can I'm, I'm waiting for the flames. I really like that. Um, now, this program couldn't exist without the coordinator of the program. It is time to talk about Jarvis. Jarvis Slacks is the coordinator of the Montgomery College Fellows at the Library of Congress pilot program. Jarvis is assistant professor of English, and he coordinates for us the course known as English 101, which is one of our composition classes. He is interested in civil rights era history, and he's been developing an expertise in the digital humanities, and some of that is overlapping work with what he's been doing with us here. He moved to Maryland in 2008, and he first began teaching for Montgomery College as a part-time instructor, and then uh, joined us with a full-time faculty. And for those of, this, those of you in the audience that don't know, that's actually a fairly typical uh, entree into the college is to start part-time, and then people can sort of get to know you and then say, okay, you're in. Um, he received his BFA and MFA in creative writing from the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, where he specialized in writing fiction. I would like to thank Jarvis for the valuable work he's done as the coordinator, and he's brought his enthusiasm, love of primary source material, interest in continuous learning, and good, genuine charm to this project. Jarvis, please join us at the front. I'll explain later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thank y'all for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of thank yous that I want to say real fast, but I do want to say thank you to Tanner and Sarah. Um, a project like this is huge and it takes a lot of work, and I do. I really appreciate Tanner and Sarah having faith in me to do it. And also, I want to say thank you to Barry. Uh, for a project like this, you need one person you can send emails to constantly, you know? And uh, it's nice to know that I have that. With Barry. So I'm a teacher, and at the end of the day, my goal is to teach my students something that I didn't know before they met me. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be a fellow for this pilot and why I agreed to be the coordinator on the MC side is so that I could help students get to know the Library of Congress. The place is absolutely amazing. It is a testament to our commitment to not only archive our past, but to learn from it so that we can have a better future. With this pilot, I wanted to allow a student to get a sense of the place, to understand the library's inner workings, and uh, provide them with a foundation that will grow along with them. Now, our students from Montgomery College aren't full-blown students yet. I mean, they're not full-blown scholars yet, um, not even close. Um, but I think that makes this project even 
better. To get one of those kids to get on the barely functioning metro, I can't say that, I'm saying it. Get them here, get them to get through security, get a reader card, and then meet me in the, a certain reader room to check in and then find me is amazing. It's more amazing than I actually thought about when I graded the finals. I should, I should appreciate that more. Um, and I have a small, it's really short story. One of my students, um, he had to write a paper on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And he had an idea, uh, if you read Dr. King's work and you read Malcolm X's work, they both reference the uh, different kind of re revolutions that happened in Africa and Asia at the time in the 60s. And he said, Professor Slacks is okay. I thought maybe find some information about what was happening in Africa and Asia, Asia and then use that to kind of back up what they were saying. I was like, well, I don't know. Of course, I'm thrilled. I'm like, eh, we'll see. Um, so he comes here. We go to the newspapers and periodicals reading room. And he talks to the clerk. And I'm, a, I'm watching them the whole time. They don't know I am. I'm like, and he comes back and he said, Professor Slacks, they want me to go to the main reading room. They have three books that I can get, but they're not here. And they can't bring them to me. I have to go. And I was like, well, OK. I was like, well, can you go with me? I'm like, no, no, no. And uh, he got kind of like, he got a little, you know, he got a little nervous. I said, you know, I gave him directions. I said, go out there, do it, and I'll meet you over there in a little bit. And the whole time I was thinking, you know, it was, this is going to either be great or it's going to be bad. We'll see. Uh, then about, I, and about an hour later, I go find him. And it takes a while. If you go from Madison to Jefferson, you have to go through the tunnels. It's a whole thing. And I get to the main reading room, and he's sitting there just reading. And this kid, he's a good student. He's a, good, he's a good student. But to see him in the main reading room, actually with no phone out, with no music playing, just actually reading these texts, if we can get one student to do that as often as possible, it makes all this worthwhile, well, right? I mean, as soon as I saw him doing that, I was like, okay, all right, we did it. This is good. And his paper was actually really good. He did a really good job. So that was, that's what the fellowship means to me. Um, to allow our students to have the chance to use these resources and to kind of guide them, and not just the students, like the faculty and everyone, kind of show them how these can work. So, with all that said, uh, we get to start talking about the fellows. I want to introduce first uh, Vicki Drake. She has a Bachelor's in Arts and History and Anthropology from Texas State University, and she is a faculty services librarian at Tacoma Park Silver Spring. Vicki's going to be our first fellow. Thank you, Vicki. So what I do with the Montgomery College is I am the Health Sciences Liaison Librarian and the Faculty Services Librarian. So I get to deal with faculty a lot in my day-to-day -day business. But when I started this program, I had three goals. One, learn about the Library of Congress. Two, create something real and meaningful that would exist past the fellowship. And three, share what I learned with the college community and beyond. Now when I started, I had no idea what I was going to end up doing. But I wanted to keep these three goals in mind from the very start. So my first goal was to learn. And that started with the Summer Teacher Institute. Now, I had used the Library of Congress before I did the, the fellowship, but it was a very casual use. I had used one thing in the manuscripts room, came, left, gone. But I wanted to do more. And in the Summer Teacher Institute, we learned about so many different places here in the Con Library of Congress, the divisions, the reading rooms, all the materials, and it was a real eye-opener. So here's a picture that was taken during my week of the Summer Teacher Institute. We learned so much about primary sources. Now, I have a history background, so I'm pretty familiar with primary sources in general, but I got to learn a lot more. It was a great foundation. One of the best things I learned was about the World Digital Library. I thought this was so cool. And I actually used the information I learned in the Summer Teacher Institute about the World Digital Library to create a library display in our library. I also learned you can actually visit and interact with the rare books. You can actually touch them. And I thought that was really, really cool. <laughs> I also learned that in the science, Connie Carter's with cookies and cheese is amazing. So um, I know she's retired, but that was really, really, really great. 
During the program, we got to have site visits, and I learned so much about copyright. And I think so many people don't realize that copyright exists. It actually does, and it can hold things back from being out in the public. So why isn't everything digitized? Well, because of copyright for a lot of reasons. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Digital reference, though, is awesome. And in my day-to-day -day life, this is going to make such a big difference. And they're very, very helpful. I love the fact that you all have a great website. Not only people say that, though, because it is a lot to learn about on the website. But you have so much available there. You have beautiful reading rooms. Every time I came over, I was just amazed to look at the architecture and the art. And I could spend hours just looking around. One thing that is so daunting about using the LOC is how is it organized? And one of the things I learned, it's all about the format. Format, format, format. Or about the language that's spoken. So got a lot of information there. My second goal was to create something real and meaningful. So what I did was I created a tutorial for the students of the college. It covers primary sources. Now, we have a lot of problems with students who come in and they need help because their professor has assigned them to use primary sources. They don't know what a primary source is. So I thought, well, let's kill two birds with one stone and create a tutorial so that they can learn before they even get to that point. It allows for the end user to really think critically. So I'm not creating this about the right answer. I want them to actually engage with it and think about them. And I am using the, the digital sources from the Library of Congress and giving credit as well. So hopefully that'll help promote your resources as well. It also includes a follow-up quiz to test their understanding. So yes, there might be some right answers, but hopefully they'll learn it from the tutorial, think critically, and then give the right answers for the professor. So this is a partial screen capture from the tutorial. You can see I'm using a map of Montgomery uh, County here. And below that is an interactive portion where they're going to engage with that source. Now my third goal was to share. So to do this, we're creating a research guide. This will be available to anyone on the internet. And it's going to cover primary sources, including the Library of Congress, resources. So that's one way I'm going to share. The other way, workshops. These are going to be primarily for faculty and staff, but it'll help share what kind of resources are available and hopefully encourage faculty and staff at Montgomery College to use the Library of Congress, come visit it, learn how to use the primary sources, learn how to use the website better. And this is a quote from one of the workshops I gave. So hopefully we'll keep on working on that. I did learn some more lessons. This is a great place to come and visit. A lot of people feel overwhelmed, but if you can get past that, it's a wonderful place to come visit and research. You got to ask a librarian, though, every time we came to a room. Oh, and please, ask a librarian. Use the Ask a Librarian. Contact us. Call us. You know, some way, please ask a librarian. So that's definitely one thing I send off to people. Make sure you use that. Another lesson I learned, everything takes longer to finish than originally estimated. The more people involved, the longer it takes, too. So I thought I was going to be done with that tutorial. It was going to be up. It won't be live until fall. But it's going to be live eventually, I promise. I need more time to spend here. I came here a lot with the fellowship. But one of the things that was frustrating for me was I didn't get a lot of personal time to spend with the collection. It was here, we're you know, touring the rooms, we're learning about the collections, and then time's over, I gotta go home. I can't spend you know, all my life here, and I really do wanna come back and spend more time. So Tanner, please let me come back. The journey that I spent in this last year was very fulfilling, even if it was twisty. And what I mean by twisty is, I wasn't sure where I was going to end up, and things changed along the way, and things that I learned made things that changed. But it was so worthwhile personally and fulfilling. Library of Congress staff, I cannot say highly enough, they are wonderful. Everyone we interacted with was patient and lovely, and I feel that they are lucky, even if there are problems, just to come in and be surrounded by these collections. I mean, the library, in the library that Jefferson built is just amazing. So that's what I learned. So next up, thank you so much. Next up is Lucinda Grinnell. She's a part-time professor in women's and gender studies. Uh, she got her BA from Sarah Lawrence College, MA in Latin American Studies, and PhD in History from the University of New Mexico. And Lucy, come on up.
So for my project, I wanted students in my online course, Gender Studies 102, Understanding LGBT Identities, to use primary sources to better understand lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT history. So before bringing students to the library, students did an activity on early lesbian and gay civil rights organizing between 1965 and 1968, using digitized items from the Frank Kemeny and Lily Vincent papers. Um, I chose the primary sources that I did because they um, were available digitally and because of the variety of kinds of sources that they represent. I thought it would be particularly interesting for students to watch a short documentary and to read different kinds of organizational documents from this time period. Um, I had students uh, engage first in an individual reflection activity with the primary documents, and then I had them discuss their experience and interpretations together in our weekly discussion forum online. Uh, and I'm gonna just show you a little excerpt of the video that I used, which is by Lily Vicente, and it's called The Second Largest Minority, and it documents the reminder day, excuse me, the Reminder Day picket at Independence Hall in Philadelphia in 1968, on July 4th, on 4th, the 4th of July in In just a minute. Okay. So that's an example of a primary source I used with students that's available through a Library of Congress blog and that comes from the Lily Vincent's papers that are in the manuscript reading room. So um, the student, like I said, the students engaged in that online activity earlier on in the semester. And we, in my class, we have a whole section devoted to LGBT history. So this is where this all fits in. Um, and then uh, towards the middle of the semester, I brought students to the manuscript reading room to conduct research in the Frank Kemeny papers, which are an LGBT history collection. Um, once we arrived to the Library of Congress that day that I brought them, and I brought students, a, a couple different groups of students to kind of hopefully get it to fit into their schedule. These are online students, so not necessarily, you know, people that are available at all times of the day. Um, and so I had them register for reading cards beforehand, and when we got there, they got their reading cards, and then we went um, right into the manuscript reading room. And um, I had perused the collection beforehand uh, to find folders that represented a diversity of topics and time periods that students could then select from um, in order to do their own research. And so while they were at the Library of Congress, they chose and copied items of interest to write about later in a reflective paper in which they both analyzed the primary sources and connected what they learned through um, looking at primary sources to the broader themes of LGBT history that we had been exploring in the course and through our textbook. So the students researched a variety of sources in the Frank Kemeny papers. These included posters, newsletters and periodicals, magazines and pamphlets, and correspondence. Um, these documents pertain to such LGBT rights groups as the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Bilitis, which are the nation's, the United States' first um, political lesbian and gay groups, and the DC Coalition of Black Gays, which is now known as the DC Coalition, was another um, part of the collection students were particularly interested in. Um, this is an example of one of the uh, posters that students looked at um, here to your right, of this, on the right of the slide. 
Uh, after the students did their research at the manuscript room, uh, we went, we walked in the underground tunnel, which on Saturday was very quiet, and when I took them during the week was more of an exciting experience. But uh, most of the students, um, like people have said um, earlier in this presentation, most of the students had never been to the Library of Congress. I actually only had one student who told me that they had. Um, and so I wanted to bring them over to the Jefferson Building to have a more full experience and to see the beautiful architecture and history. Uh, here in this building. So that's a photo of students um, over here. Um, so I wanted to, uh, I think that the, the students' words um, speak most profoundly to their experience using primary sources at the Library of Congress. So I wanted to quickly highlight a couple of comments from students. Um, and these are selected comments. Uh, the first one, of course, is from the one student who, did, who had been to the Library of Congress before. Um, and she said, I had been to the Library of Congress a few times before, but had never visited the archives room, uh, meaning the manuscript reading room. Until this visit was announced, I honestly didn't realize there was a true room where anyone can go to dive into the archives. For me, the most interesting thing wasn't necessarily the content of the documents, all they were, but the idea that we were able to physically hold documents that were held by those standing up for their rights and freedom many years ago. In one of the packets was a membership card dated June 20th, 1964 that belonged to Franklin E. Kemeny and declared him an honorary member of the Sons of Bolitis. Kemeny was a gay rights activist and co-founder of the Mattachin Society and was actually fired by the U.S. government for being gay. To hold something like that which belonged to such an influential person was really extraordinary. It made me wonder if any of the people creating the documents we experienced, thought about what would happen to them 40 years into the future. And then briefly from another student, I viewed documents pertaining to the Stonewall Inn as well as original documents and posters from the first gay parade in San Francisco. I was able to see and feel original signatures and it just made the whole situation that much more important to me and I almost felt as if I were there. This is definitely a must do. If you live or are ever in the area, it was a great experience. So in the fall, I plan to continue uh, to bring students from this um, online class to the library. I've also um, recently met your new reference librarian, Meg Metcalf, uh, who, has, uh, who I've talked to about possibly doing an orientation to um, LGBT uh, materials that are in other rooms, like uh, in rare books. So I'm excited to continue this work in the future, and I want to thank everybody that has uh, been so helpful in the project, particularly the people in the manuscript reading room um, who've been very helpful to me and my students when we've come. Thanks. Okay, next up is Gail Meyer-Smith. She has a, she's a college-wide coordinator for the dance program and professor at Rockville campus. She has a BS in speech and drama and English from East Carolina University, an MA in speech and theater from the Catholic University, and a PhD in dance and related arts from Texas Women's University. Gail, come on up. Uh, did you know that Martha Graham's iconic modern dance, Appalachian Spring, was commissioned by and first performed at the Library of Congress? That the dances of, dancers of the American Ballet Theater made a cookbook while they were on strike so they could earn money and get them better working conditions? that the Lion King choreographer, Garth Fagan, danced at Fidel Castro's inauguration. These facts and many others came to light as my modern dance two and three class embarked upon their projects at the Library of Congress. Although modern dance is a technique class in which we dance every day, it has turned out to be the perfect class for this project. The students' trepidation about doing research turned into confidence in their own choices and decisions, which not only makes them better students, but it makes them better dancers as well. The original assignment uh, looked something like this, and the requirements for this project included the selection of a research topic that just had to be related to something about dance the development of research questions, at least one visit to the Library of Congress, 
reflections on their visits and research pro process, and a final presentation of the research and the sources they found at the library and the making of an original dance about their experience. The dancers chose topics ranging from how choreographers developed their own dance techniques to Native American dance and the ghost dance in particular, to dance therapy, especially for older people, to what we can learn from dance photographs. Armed with the many questions they had about their topics, we all first visited the library at Montgomery College, and one of my colleagues, one of my fellows uh, of this, gave a wonderful presentation about uh, research tools. The students then spent a good bit of time on the Library of Congress website, and we did get their, them to order their um, reader cards. So on the day that we came to the Library of Congress, we started at the reader registration room and everyone was amazed that they had their picture taken and their library card in their hand in no time at all. Um, and so the class was very thrilled about their in-person visit because it was a first for most of them. Um, in fact, they were so excited, they danced for joy. <laughs> so, we had the uh, meet me at the fountain was the password for that day and we all hooked up with each other then. I'd like to share with you some quotes that they wrote in their papers. Kathleen said, I found the experience to be enriching and thought provoking. Erica said, I thought the library was going to be boring. But after viewing the sec different sections of the library, I'm really interested in going back. Nana said, the main reading room was simply astounding. The marble everywhere and the detailed ceiling made me feel like a kid in some type of fiction book. In spite of the fire drill <laughs> that kept us out on the sidewalk for nearly an hour, the, their excitement continued when we entered the performing arts reading room. And you can see there a catalog of the many wonderful uh, dance items that are in the collection in the Performing Arts Reading Room. Um, Dr. Libby Smeagol made eight friends for life with her openness and her accessibility. I sent her the student topics in advance so that when we visited, each student was delighted that she had pulled items that addressed each of their topics. So those are some of the things that she laid out for us. Several students visited the library more than once and they all used the website and online resources extensively. One student commented that seeing the items online and seeing them in person, actually touching them, were very different experiences. She said, it was an amazing experience to be able to touch the photographs. Being able to shuffle through the original works was a completely different experience from scrolling through pages on the website. When I touched the photo, I got a sense of connection to the movement and to the person in the movement. They all agreed that opening a box and discovering what was inside was like a treasure hunt. Jan, says, the hardest part was waiting for the box to suddenly appear on my table. The presentations of their research were lively and thought-provoking. Using PowerPoint or Prezi's, uh, they showed selected items that supported and embellished their topics. They were asked to include an anecdote from their research and an interactive segment that the whole class could get up and experience in movement. For example, the student with the topic of dance photography asked each student to choose a photo and make a short movement phrase. Here you can see them with the, their poses and the photos that inspired them. Um, the final activity of this project was for each student to make a dance about the experience and the results of their research. Jan, whose project um, was about dance photography will give you some insight as to how one dances about research. She says, simply from viewing these images, I had the great urge to start dancing. 
I started to make up phrases of movement in my head, and I wanted to copy and paste the photos into a dance that was something completely my own. I have three brief examples of the dances my students made about their research. The first one is Layla, whose research on Cafri Ca African and Caribbean dance led her to Catherine Dunham. The next one is Nana, who looked at the dance techniques developed by Eric Hawkins and Pearl Primus. So this final one is Cassie, whose study of Afro-Caribbean dance and its influence on modern dance led her to discover something about her own roots. So if we didn't know it before we visited the Library of Congress, it became clear to us that as dancer, choreographer, and anthropologist Pearl Primus once said, dance is strong magic. Thank you. Hi, our next fellow is Niai. Pinda. Uh, she has an MLS from University of Maryland, College Park, an MA in English Literature and from University of India, and a BA from uh, an MS from University of Bharata, India. I didn't know you went to school in India. We gotta talk about that. That sounds great. Uh, everybody say hey yeah. I was uh, very excited, very fortunate to have participated in this program, this, uh, the week-long summer institute, as well as the subsequent visit to all the different uh, library congresses, uh, reading room, provided me a very solid foundation. Uh, and uh, being a librarian, I wanted to use this experience to create uh, instructional activity. Um, incorporating what I had learned. So here is, uh, I just wanted to show you what I did for my uh, faculty, my professional development uh, activity. So I created um, a workshop called Unlocking the Power of Primary Source Research from the Library of Congress. And uh, my project in a nutshell, I wanted to uh, uh, make sure that you know, I um, demonstrated to my colleagues how Library of Congress primary sources can be used to undergraduate research at our college and to create uh, class projects, assignment, leading to student success and uh, lifelong learning. So um, I talked about the benefits and challenges involved in teaching with primary sources. And like Carolyn mentioned, um, our uh, student population is just so diverse and so unique. So um, I also talked about what challenges it brings and what primary sources mean to our students in this digital age. So uh, my, this is my project in a nutshell. Uh, I did an icebreaker activity. Um, I gave an uh, overview of my fellowship program just so that, you know, in future uh, the faculty would be inspired to uh, apply for this program. Uh, I did a modeling of a critical analysis activity and idea sharing and um, uh, how we can use the primary sources. So for my icebreaker activity, what I did was uh, 
I selected some primary sources on few selected themes uh, so that later in the workshop I focused on how to analyze these sources to explore the themes uh, at a deeper level. And here you can see uh, some of the uh, primary sources that I have laid out and some of the, I can see Tanner here, um, uh, some of the faculty members uh, looking at the uh, primary sources here as an icebreaker uh, activity. And then here is my uh, class. I, I'm, leading um, uh, my session, uh, my faculty, and showing them a couple of uh, primary sources and how to uh, engage in uh, critical analysis for uh, these uh, classes. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to also just make sure that I modeled an activity for them, just to kind of you know tell them this was. I felt uh, at times that I was preaching to a choir because you know here I was teaching the faculty as to how to teach, which I was like not really really qualified for. Uh, but so I thought that here I could, if I could demonstrate what I have uh, learned here, maybe you know that will tell itself. So I uh, selected from the print and uh, photograph division, I uh, use this Louis Hine photograph. And um, uh, as a group, we studied this photograph, uh, trying to connect it to what we already knew and what we could learn from that. Um, and then we brainstorm: could this photograph uh, uh, or photographs like that, uh, could it be used as an entry point uh, for a deeper research to engage students? Um, could it be effective for a student writing a paper on, in, in English, uh, uh, you know? Or could it be used to introduce a unit on rise of industrialization in America? Or can we link it to migrant uh, farm workers or even to war refugees or, um, you know, uh, somebody working on global child labor issues or on sweatshops? Uh, so this just provides endless possibilities, and Montgomery County is all about endless possibilities. Um, um, a fellow faculty uh, participant later told me how he successfully incorporated what I had presented on the primary sources to his course, and Al Kapekian, uh, for his English 101 class. He showed this photograph to English 101 students, and even prior to the discussion, some students immediately connected to this course, the course's theme, the generational fate of farm workers in a Dominican Republic as depicted in Juno Diaz's The Dreamer. So he was very, very inspired to you know, uh, use that, and he, he really loved it. So um, what are the benefits of teaching with primary sources? Um, I think learning with primary sources is really inquiry-based uh, research. It connects with past and it, it, uh, it, it uh, questions your assumptions. Uh, you, it is so fragmented, controversial, so you want to really you know, uh, dive deep into it to try and find out. It fosters your critical thinking as we, uh, during the model activity, we kind of you know, uh, brainstormed about that. It is so inclusive and engaging for our students. And just because our students are so diverse and so unique, some of them are adult students. So it is really, in, you know, it just brings the class together when they are working on something like this. Uh, it is such an integ uh, integrative and interdisciplinary learning, I thought, that I just wanted to, you know, uh, throw in some uh, points to you. And this is and something that my faculty also mentioned as we were brainstorming this. Um, so, and we have uh, all kinds of learner at uh, Montgomery College. And so this is like, you know, this kind of a visual learning is something that, you know, uh, they, the experience they can leave with, they can uh, take with them. So that was something that I thought that was very, very interesting, what I learned and I wanted to share with my faculty members. Um, so that was what I did. and. Um, so uh, Kelly mentioned earlier about our students, uh, how Montgomery College uh, uh, student population is. And as of the fall uh, 2015 student demographics, like she said, we have about 150 countries represented. We have adult students coming in here. Our student age is uh, typically you know, about 25 or so. Some of them are, or most of them, are actually international students. Maybe they are not so used to the American history, or they cannot really connect to the primary sources as perhaps 
including me, uh, you know, as some of you can connect. And so looking at this and analyzing the primary source and just the idea of coming here, you know, in the Library of Congress and maybe doing some research is just such a wonderful experience for them. Um, so that was something that, you know, I just thought that that would also contribute to the student success. Um, so the ideas for the class project that we shared, and um, so some of these are my ideas, some of these are, you know, ideas came from my faculty, like Professor Rindler, who was there. Um, so, you know, like teach through a combination of concepts and ideas, kind of create a framework and set of primary sources, not just one primary source, use some more primary sources, create some short assignment, like, you know, give them a picture or a photograph and then have them analyze that and have them, what it brings to them, maybe it brings their own, their own experience experiences, what they have experienced in their own country or, you know, learned through their, their parents or grandparents. Um, so these are some of the ideas for the short um, assignments. And it does foster a group discussion among the students. You know, they are kind of just so much into it, so they just want to, you know, bring in there. They have points of, uh, you know, their own different points of view in there. The perspectives are there, so they're questioning everything. So it's more like an inquiry-based learning. That is something that we are promoting at Montgomery College. Um, and um, we are also working on, you know, self-reflection and e-portfolio. And I thought that this is something that, you know, sheer experience of going to Library of Congress probably could be, you know, if it can make its way in the e-portfolio, that will be something they can talk to, you know, their, um, you know, future generation about what their experience was. Um, and of course, you know, to at least plan a visit to the Library of Congress. Um, so here are some of the faculty feedbacks. Um, after my, um, my, my presentation, my workshops, I did two workshops uh, at two different campuses. And after that, I sent um, like a, you know, e email about what they thought and if they are actually using it or if they're planning to use that. And here is what, um, you know, some of my faculty members came back with. And I thought I was, it, that was a very inspiring uh, thing for me that, you know, we are all so jazzed up and wanted to spice up our, um, uh, our teaching here. So looking ahead, what do, you, what, what do I want to do? Um, I want to, of course, uh, you know, promote this to my fellow librarians because it's not just only ma me who's been teaching, you know, there are so many 16 of us are teaching the uh, library sessions and I wanted to make sure that, you know, all of our librarians know how to research uh, using the Library of co um, Congress's primary sources, the reading room uh, areas, how to go around that so that they can in their turn help the faculty. We have a couple of uh, workshops uh, slated already. Vicky and I are going to be working with our library uh, staff. I also have a professional day workshop plan and then I have a college-wide uh, lib guide so if I have a minute I can perhaps just show it how it works. Uh, so what it is is it's just um, uh, it's going to work as a toolkit, a research toolkit for our faculty, uh, for our college uh, community and beyond as to what we did, what the fellows program is and how it can help and what are the different reading rooms uh, here. Um, so that is something that you know um, since I enjoyed participating in this program, I thought that I would just share with them. All right, our next fellow is me. When this program first started, I had to make a really interesting decision. Um, Sarah asked me to be a coordinator, and I was like, I kind of want to be a coordinator, but I also want to be a fellow. And I knew that if I said no to being a coordinator, I would feel jealous forever. So I had to do it. Um, but also, Sarah allowed me to work with um, the fellows and be a fellow as well. So it was great to do both, which was, at times it was a little ambitious, but it worked out. And so uh, this project actually started three years ago, even before all this started. Uh, I wanted to do a rhetorical analysis, and so we decided, I decided to do a rhetorical analysis of Dr. King's um, I Had a Dream speech. And I asked students, I said, students, when was slavery abolished? And the student raised his hand and said, yes, sir. He said, 1965. I said, OK, we got to start from the beginning, don't we? <laughs> um, and so I realized, I think one of the reasons why a lot of students from Montgomery College have a hard time understanding the civil rights movement is because a lot of them, some of them ha aren't from the United States. A lot of them are from other countries. And two, this kind of reflects on, on my educational background. It just wasn't taught that well to me when I was in grade school. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to use the Library of Congress's resources 
to augment their understanding of the, of the civil rights movement, to understand it more. And to do that, we, I wanted to use primary source material. And so I used two reading rooms, essentially, the prints and photographs reading room and the mostly the newspapers and periodicals reading room. And that allowed the students to have a deeper sense of the civil rights movement. I mean, it's easy for me to sit in front of a classroom and tell them all this stuff, but for them to actually read archival information, to see primary sources of the time period, is far more lasting. So these are my kids. Uh, this is uh, Josue, uh, that is Hardy, and that is Michael Martinez. Um, the newspaper pre reading room was an interesting experience. About 10 of them showed up on a Saturday, which I was very impressed about. Uh, and they wanted to, first I said, okay, let me get you on the, the computers, we can use the databases, we can do all this. And then one of the students was like, what's that? What's that thing? Said, oh, that's a microfiche. Oh, you gonna show us how to use it. Like, oh, okay. And I, we, one of the assistants there showed how to use the machines. They, that's all they did for three hours. <laughs> like, I was just blown away. One of those guys, Hardy, he walked by me with five things of microfiche. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm researching. Like, he, just, he looked at me like, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do. And it's funny, uh, using the machines, and it took a while to warm it up, it took us a while to understand how to use it, but they really appreciated going through the newspapers, and one at a time, sheet after sheet, looking for information that's going to make their paper better. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But I was extremely impressed with how quickly they took to this, arc, this old way of looking at information. And, they, and one of the students was like, this is neat. Like, this is, this is cool to do. And, and in fact, them using the newspapers and microfiche allowed them to have a deeper sense of what was going on at the time. Um, for the most part, it worked out well. There was, some, there was a little bit of different things they had to learn. I had to teach them how to have patience with research. Uh, at, before they even did anything, I said, you might spend all day here and not find anything that will help you. And they understood that, they took it, and for the most part, we shared information. So all the students, they used one USB drive to collect anything they got from the microfiche, and they were able to dip back into it later. I used a cloud service, and so what I did was I took all the different PDFs they made that day, and I put it into one cloud file, and then I sent the link to them, and they could click on it and use it, and that was really helpful. They were able to kind of um, use all their they were able to work together in a really good way. That's something I'm definitely going to keep again. Them doing that together was a really good experience. So my the students use a variety of resources at the Library of Congress. They use newspapers, periodicals mainly. Uh, but they also use books and resources provided for them from the main reading room. A few of them found some uh, interesting resources from different reading rooms. And it, it was a learning experience for me. And that was something that the fellows and I talked about. Every time we sent students there, or every time we went there, we were able to kind of chip at the problem. Okay, how do we send kids here? And we learned, okay, it's not a good idea just to kind of put them in a room and leave them. You kind of have to scaffold, you have to kind of get them ready for it, but then eventually it all works out. We also had interesting orientations. We had a really good orientation at the photographs and prints reading room, at the prints and photographs reading room, sorry. And they were able to see civil rights um, photos and prints of the time period, not just from the civil rights movement of African Americans, but also from the Japanese internment camps, which John will talk about um, more with you. So it was a cultural experience for them. Uh, this photo here, the Library of Congress had the civil rights exhibit, which was fantastic, by the way. If you know people who put on exhibits, you just might put a bug in the ear to do it again. Um, we were really lucky to have this flag. This flag was a uh, whole extended out of the NAACP office in New York, I believe, every time a man was lynched. So the next day they put this, they put this flag out, and John also is gonna talk more about that. Um, but that's the actual flag. And for extra credit, I told my students, come to the Library of Congress, take a picture of that flag, find out why it's important. And each one, they had to write a two-page write-up about why the flag was important. And so I think it's interesting that when this picture was taken, I took this picture, uh, that's the actual primary source but then the students, you can see the reflection in their iPhones. And so a lot of times we talk about um, the digital, right? How the students are on their phones, students are using their phones, students are using digital. We have to meet them where they are. Well, we can do that, but we also have to understand what we're going to do with it. We can hand kids an iPad and say, research, but they're like, I, I can use this as a Frisbee, I can use it as a plate. But if you show them what to do with it, it makes far more sense, it works far more better. And so a lot of times these kids use their digital devices 
to um, take pictures at the Library of Congress to do their research. And I think in some ways they actually understood that it's not just a toy, it's actually a tool they can use. That was not my only job. As a coordinator, uh, my main job as a coordinator was work with Barry Howard. And so a lot of times uh, I would throw out ideas about reading rooms that we could go to, and then Barry would send back ideas that could work. He'd make connections there, I'd make connections with him. And that was most, that was most of the work is making those connections. I also had to interview uh, potential fellows. I had to schedule important events. Uh, I learned the value of Outlook Mail. <laughs> and, um, the, uh, and also, I learned, I learned a val valuable experience about working intensely with other people. Um, I feel like I'm a very patient person. Uh, and I, there were times where I'm like, I just need you to email me back. I was looking at my computer to send me a confirmation, <laughs> somebody. Uh, and so a lot of times, a project like this, especially in a pilot form, takes a lot of patience on, on everybody's part. But when it all comes together, like it did today, it's really worth it. I also, my job was also to catalog our experiences for posterity. So the reports that you have, I collected probably 70% of it. Uh, and in hindsight, uh, and, and hopefully if we get to do this more, I will definitely spend a lot of time writing people's names down in a more efficient pattern. So I, we, met, we met a lot of people, a lot of people. Uh, and developing relationships with different reading rooms for future visits, I can't stress this enough. It's important, like, I tell people this as a one-on-one -on -one coordinator for composition, and I tell my students this, and I tell this people when I talk to, humanities, right? It's, People, like they're people. Like we can study writing, we can read books, but at the end of the day, if you don't know how to have a conversation with a person and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, how you doing? Then it's almost like a mute point. Like a lot of our learning, one of the reasons why we read books, one of the reasons why we um, watch good movies, one of the reasons why we listen to good music is so we can understand each other better, right? And so developing those relationships with individuals made this pilot far more successful than it could have been otherwise. That's it, thank you. Oh, there's a picture. So this is at Prince and Photographs Reading Room, and that's, I think, almost all the fellows. Uh, and last but not least, we have John Wong. He has a BA in economics from University of Berkeley, uh, MA uh, in English from Southern Mississippi, which is an interesting conversation point we have to have one day, and also a PhD from Florida State University. And he also is an editor for Jute uh, Independent uh, Journal, and he works on the Potomac Review. John, come on up. So my background is in English slash creative writing, and uh, as a result of that, I work with these literary journals, um, which didn't come into play for um, the Library of Congress this time around, but it's something uh, I'm concerning for the next time. At McGreen College, I teach composition, literature, and creative writing. Um, but to adapt the Library of Congress to my um, classroom, I decided to focus on composition since that's the bulk of my uh, teaching duties, and also that's, that's where most of my students uh, come in. I, I couldn't work all three into that. Uh, so for composition, uh, working with first-year composition for my English 101 and 102 classes, primarily we do, uh, we work with rhetoric. We, we analyze rhetoric, we uh, critique rhetoric, and um, we compare rhetoric, and we, then we write rhetoric. <laughs> so um, for, for my students, um, I ask them to uh, well, I prepare them by saying, you have to go to the Library of Congress. It's not extra credit, you have to go. <laughs> and I want to get as many of them here as possible. And I challenge them to find a piece of rhetoric to analyze. Uh, and um, for a comparison analysis paper, I ask them to compare something they find at the Library of Congress with something else. It could be another piece from the Library of Congress, or it could be uh, with something from the present day. Um, or uh, it could be from present day, from different sources, it's sort of at least one thing from Library of Congress. And we did, for my class, have uh, a focus on civil rights, um, current events, civil rights, uh, issues related to race, gender, sexual orientation, um, immigration, and so on. And you know, there's so many things going on today that have to do with all that. Uh, to prepare them for the visit, um, I show them one piece of uh, visual text from the Library of Congress, which was this photograph, uh, which captured how that flag was displayed back in the day whenever um, a man was lynched, um, so whenever a black man was lynched, and the NAACP would hang this flag outside the, the headquarters. And this photo is taken from a Library of Congress website. So I, I, I utilized the, um, 
the Library of Congress, uh, the diagnostic tool. We, we, we looked at it, we came up with observations, reflections, and asked questions. I did that on its own at first with just the flag, and then I asked them to compare it to present day. So we considered uh, the Black Lives Matter t-shirt. <laughs> just imagine a t-shirt with, <laughs> with those words on it. Um, and then we performed a comparison analysis in class. So the students were very quick to catch on and see that, in fact, this very historical uh, photograph and, and artifact is still very relevant today. So uh, by analyzing the two, we can look at how far we've come or not come <laughs> and what issues still remain and how we may utilize a primary source, a historical primary source, to better inform where we still have to go today or how, we, how things are uh, going today. Um, afterwards, I brought the students here. I think I brought about 70 to 80 students to the Library of Congress through many trips. <laughs> it was, that was the most difficult task, I think, of the whole year, just herding all the students together. I give them maps with arrows showing which entrance to go to and where to meet, and still, like, a third of the students would show up half an hour to an hour later saying, oh, I was in the main reading room, and, and I'd be impressed that they even got there in the first place. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we did... Um, come to the Library of Congress, and, and that was, I can't emphasize the wonder uh, that these students experienced. Even before we showed up, when I told them they would go see that flag and that photograph, I asked students saying, you mean that particular thing? We're gonna see that thing? And they would say, yes, it's here, it's on display right now, the Library of Congress. Um, and so it, it was just a sense of marvel as the students came, and of course everybody immediately took out their cameras, uh, their phones, and started taking pictures and something that, that you could see really resonated with the students and left an impact on them. Uh, so for our trip, we, I brought everybody over and we, each person got their library cards. I uh, wanted them to see the main reading room because you had to. Uh, and I also made a point to get all our students into both of these reading rooms, the newspaper and periodicals reading room and the prints and photographs reading room, particularly because for um, uh, work relating to rhetorical texts, whether it be written or visual, these were the most effective, most readily available uh, to be used for classroom uh, purposes. Okay. So here's a student uh, utilizing the, the microphone uh, reader at the Princeton, uh, at the newspaper and periodicals reading room. And the students had a blast with this, as, as Jarvis students did too. Um, while we were scrolling these, because we have so many students, we couldn't uh, spend a lot, a lot of time in each room, but so, so, so there were times when I would have some students and we all gather around one uh, microphone reader, and as we scroll through these, you could see the light bulbs going on in the students' heads as they consider the visual texts from these historical times, especially when the advertisements came by, you can see the way people dressed back in like 1980 or <laughs> what have you, and students would, oh my God, that's, that's crazy what people wore, or the advertisements what uh, people used to sell and how they would try to sell it. Right? So these visual, te uh, well, these rhetorical uh, communications are coming through and you can just see the wheels turning uh, and students seeing the historical um, time in a way they would not be able to if they were to use uh, the Google, right? <laughs> as they would like to say. So that was, that was one really neat moment where you could capture history in a way that the internet just cannot. Uh, we visited the prints and photographs reading room as well. The, the staff was fantastic, uh, where they set up a little exhibit just for us, and they uh, brought out historical um, political cartoons, posters, uh, all these right materials for visual rhetorical analysis. And let's see, so for my 102 class, I asked them to compare um, different visual rhetorical texts. And as an example, we looked at uh, some of these images available from the prints and photographs division. Uh, in this case, these are photographs of the Japanese internment camps during World War II. These photographs were taken by the office, the FSA, Farm Security Administration, OWI, Office of War Information. Okay. Specifically, it was a government agency going around taking photographs uh, to galvanize the war effort, right? to kind of show what's going on and make everybody feel good. Um, so we looked at these texts of these Japanese Americans being interned, and we in class, we looked at the, the messages coming through. So you see lots of happy people and this group activity going on. And then we examined uh, Ansel Adams' photographs of Japanese internment uh, in similar situations. They looked rather different. 
they told a very different visual story. <laughs> and again, the light bulbs went on in the students' heads and, and they said, wow, you know, these photos are rather bleak and, and kind of sad. <laughs> and it, it gave a very different story from the FSA OWI photographs. So they were able to compare the different visual texts uh, and, and come up with um, some greater um, insights and uh, significance. So some students, uh, these are some photographs that students use for their own papers in my 102 class. One student uh, analyzed these photographs from the segregation, or desegregation, I should say, period. Um, two, Japanese, uh, two girls going to school and then um, some, <laughs> the governor, I think, blocking the entrance to a school. And another student chose to analyze uh, these historical images uh, um, related to Chinese immigrants, and of course, I, I had to ask him, well, how does this relate to present day? You know, uh, and we had a conversation about um, certain proposed bans on certain populations <laughs> and such. And um, Jarvis was able to help us set up a SurveyMonkey uh, survey for student feedback, and the, the student response was overwhelmingly positive. People just would not, uh, pe many students voiced the idea that uh, they didn't know this thing existed here. <laughs> and also that um, they learned that they could do so much more with it later on down the road. Now, those were two of the primary sentiments I think we got. It was, this was amazing. I, I didn't know I could do this. And even if I can't use that much of it now, I know I could use it later on in the future. Yeah. Lots, lots of feel good <laughs> moments there. I think you have a sense now for why we're so delighted with this year. Um, it's been really quite terrific. Um, first, if we could all give a round of applause to those six fellows. I'd like to do just a few quick thank yous. Um, we feel this has been a very um, successful pilot. Um, we're delighted with the innovation that has been demonstrated here, but we also have some great ideas moving forward. Um, I do want to recognize, if you would um, take a peek at page six in the report, you'll see that we have a list of a lot of the library employees that helped um, us with this year. Um, and I know that we've missed a few, and I'm sorry, we did put our heads together and combed over our notes, and we apologize uh, to those we have not named, but we love you nevertheless, and we are gonna reprint the report, and if you'll help me, I'll rename them, and then we'll live happily ever after. Um, this has been really a very um, large and um, it's been a lot of hard work um, to pull it together and a great deal of teamwork and honestly it just um, I think is a model of cooperative uh, work between two um, institutions and then within the um, divisions and programs uh, within those two institutions. Um, I will say that the one, one silly thing I've come away with is I've never seen so many different divisions and programs and the, the names of the various divisions at this library amaze me. And I would like to work at the directorate. Some of you get to work in the directorate, so it's, it's awesome. Um, so just a few names here and, um, and I, have, um, I have a few gifts. Um, and so the problem is that actually a handful of them are behind that screen that was assembled while I was busy over there. So I will track down um, a handful of people. Here we go. Let's just um, quickly, I'd like to say, to George Colburn, who was not able to be here today because he is busy with his interns and fellows um, with the National and International Outreach Program. Thank you so much, George, for your leadership. He has really um, taken on this program and, and made it uh, be remarkably um, successful. Barry, again, Thank you so much for all that you've done uh, as our liaison and the face for the project. Um, it's been a remarkable pleasure working with you. Blaine, 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 Blaine. I have a little gift for you behind, <clears throat> behind the screen. Um, the lady or the tiger, I'm not sure. Um, Blaine was our original partner as we um, envisioned the project and he has been really um, remarkable and, and, and he was our, our original parent and, and we were moved to a new family, and honestly, uh, how it could be so to have two such fabulous families. Um, I want you to thank Dawn Stitzel for us, if you would, 
um, in our original family, if you will. Um, I do want to make note that Mark Sweeney, who is the Associate Librarian in Library Services, is actually the man who signed our MOU, uh, and Dr. Rye from our institution. And I would like to thank those two people, because honestly, as you know, you can't get anywhere without your signature. So Mark, we thank you. We thank you, and, and Barry will take um, a copy of our Potomac Review and a little gift for him. Um, again, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Jane McAuliffe, uh, Director at NIU for her leadership and support and for her um, willingness and wantingness to move forward, uh, which we're very delighted. At MC, we'd just like to um, give a nod to Clarice Somersall, who's retiring, and she is uh, Tanner's boss, and to Carolyn Terry, who's here with us in the audience. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and please do share um, our thanks to Dr. Pollard, our college president. Uh, we have today uh, Montgomery College Television here. Uh, recording today's event, and so there will be a program that is the entirety of the, um, from start to finish, but they have agreed to um, do each one of the fellows' presentations as a, several, a separate piece so that you could YouTube based on just that piece, and this is something that we learned from our Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship that we've been doing for a while, is that people sometimes are very interested in a specific program, and we're, they're going to help us make that a little bit easier. So um, if we could thank Danielle Stetsky, our producer director, and her team member, uh, Brian O'Neill, who also is uh, producer director, who specializes in the work with our students. I'd like to say that um, Montgomery College is remarkably lucky and, and we feel that to be within uh, reach of the library, for our students to be able to get on the metro, uh, and after some time on the metro, hopefully get here. Um, for those of you who are local will know the joke there. Um, the, there are really few other schools in the region that are community colleges that have this access, and we feel committed to getting our students here and for them to learn from the library to develop their research skills, to feel a confidence. Um, we have already seen that they want to bring family members back. They are excited, and, and the beauty of the buildings is really a draw, but it is this scholarly endeavor where they um, peer down into a box and see a poster, or they can touch a document. They can actually hold in these beautiful, um, carefully wrapped photographs, in case you were worried that our students were actually touching things. They are carefully wrapped um, primary source materials. And our students are just wowed by that experience to hold these objects, these artifacts, original manuscripts and such, to see posters. And it's so meaningful to them. And we see that our students are growing and that our students are more sophisticated. We hope that, um, I, I think maybe some of you don't realize that a community college student actually has to apply to college for their second two years, right? We do just the first two years of um, a four-year degree. So the students must transfer, and that's actually a whole process with applications, and some of them in the more competitive schools are really having to write thoughtful essays. They have stories to tell after coming here. They have stories to tell that are compelling and meaningful, and, and we're excited about that. We also think that once our students transfer, um, even to some very competitive schools, that they will have some skills that make them feel confident in that new arena. Um, sometimes when you um, really have that new set of skills, there's just a little bit different way that you stand and you hold and think about yourself. So we're really excited um, and delighted and pleased and, and really moved, I think, by that. Um, we want you to look for our students. Um, we're gonna make it easy for you to find them. Um, they will have a reader card, and it is true that the reader cards, you can get them really quickly. This is the formal reader identification card for the Library of Congress. Um, if you carefully punch a hole in one side, not with a barcode, dear students, um, then you will know that the student belongs to us. The lanyards read um, hashtag MC at LOC and also say Montgomery College. And you all have one of those tucked away in a bag for you somewhere also with a mm -hmm. thumb drive so that you can share information. Um, sharing the information in the cloud I thought was terrific, um, Jarvis, and I know that that's something that some of our other faculty will do for that. Um, thank you. Thank you all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this program and we look forward to seeing what might happen next. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.